Hey folks, eternal exhaustion of the spotless Darren from Fervent Astronomy here. Today with the Pentax K33, Pentax's most recent camera or interchangeable lens camera to date. And I know there's a monochrome version, don't at me. It's the same camera, right? But uh, yeah, it's a Pentax. We're gonna talk about a Pentax. Aha! Oh boy, I'm looking forward to this. So a lot of you probably don't know because given the nature of what I've been putting out uh, as far as reviews up to this point, but I have been a Pentax person in the past. Still have, I would say a fair amount of Pentax film gear uh, still kicking around, but I have uh, sort of moved on from the digital side of things uh, until I got an opportunity to take a look at this thing and I jumped at it basically. So. The K33 has a lot of compelling features for astrophotography. You know, as far as image quality goes, it's got a APS-C sized 26 megapixel sensor, probably a Sony sensor, probably one we've seen before in other cameras, probably going to give us really decent image quality. But ultimately what makes this thing actually worth taking a look at is some of the bells and whistles, which is not usually the case. Key amongst those bells and whistles is Astro Tracer, which is something that uh, I guess Rico and or Pentax have a patent on, which allows it to actually move the sensor to track the sky, freeing you from the need to actually use a star tracker. The way they do this is, if you see there's a little SR here somewhere, uh, turns out this DSLR and, you know, every Pentax DSLR going back years and years, has IBIS, in-body image stabilization, built in. So that lets it do a couple of neat things. And it just so happens that this seems to be one of those things that kind of Rico has a lockdown on. So if you want it, kind of have to buy a Pentax camera. And the thing about it is, in the past, I haven't found it to be very useful. Uh, I had a K1, I've had lots of Pentax cameras actually over the years, and you have to do this like, weird dance where you're like spinning it around to calibrate the gyros and it needs a GPS. And if it doesn't have inbuilt GPS, you have to buy this big thing. And it was just a hassle and it never really worked that well. However, this camera now debuts a type three Astro Tracer mode, which has also been trickled down to some of the other cameras via firmware. And that allows it to just do its job. Just sit on a tripod, you just turn it on, no dance, you know, none of that, no GPS, and it actually, potentially, can do a really good job. I'm speculating, but they're probably tracking the star trails across the sensor and running some algorithms over it, and then essentially speculating on, on what the path is going to take and moving the sensor to, to do that. It gives you, based on your focal length and shot time, an estimated length of time that it can track before it sort of runs out of space and well does it work we're gonna find out aren't we there are a couple other things too like intervalometer stuff built in and a red mode like this this camera actually has a red mode where you can have the whole back lcd red and nice for your night vision uh, i wish more cameras did that but here we are and overall it just is actually fairly compelling for astrophotography. So I could just talk about it. We're not gonna go over all the, like, it's well built, it's got lots of buttons, it's a DSLR, it's got, you know, all that DSLR stuff. Uh, if you really wanna learn more about that, there's plenty of good reviews. This is, you know, a three-year-old camera at this point, but uh, let's pop into Lightroom now and actually look at some results and see if it's worth it for astrophotography. Hey folks. Welcome to Lightroom, where we're looking at the Pentax K3 Mark III, or some samples taken with that camera. I will couch that right off the bat by saying, personally, I think there's limited usefulness to doing this. Most modern cameras are really good these days. Gone are the days where, you know, really worrying about noise performance and that type of stuff was a big concern. So I just want to get that out of the way. It's going to be pretty light. Just going to chit chat about some of the features of the camera and look at a couple of these and uh, get you on your way. Some of these samples will be available. Some of them are tracked with the Fornax Mounts Light Track 2. So typically if you see one that's 
180 seconds. It's uh, tracked with the, that mount. Full disclosure, Fervent Astronomy is Fornax's North American distributor, so if you're interested in learning more about that mount, head on over to fervinastronomy.com. If you're more interested in Astro Tracer, got a couple photos here taken of the Orion Nebula. These are with Astro Tracer. We'll get to those in a sec. You will notice, of course, that some of these are very, very green. What could be giving this color cast? Well, when you know my luck, I head out to my Astronomy Club's dark site, and this nonsense shows up and it hung around for hours. I wasn't able, I was out there to do work, take a bunch of samples. I wasn't able to uh, do that for quite a while, even after it sort of calmed down. It's still got in the way sometimes. So I know some of you are out there cursing me right now for finding that an inconvenience, but it's, it is what it is. You'll notice most of these samples are taken at ISO 400. Almost all of them, there's one or two that aren't. And that's because the Pentax K3 Mark III uses a sensor that is ISO invariant past ISO 400. What does that mean? Well, this camera seems to only really have a couple of analog amplification steps, which you can think of as real ISO values. The other ISO values are simulated. So in the case of everything above ISO 400, all the camera is doing is doing what we do in Lightroom here and boosting the exposure digitally. It gives you great usable results, but it doesn't give you results with any better noise performance than you could get here at the native ISO, or let's say more recoverable shadows. Doesn't give you those either. What it does do is lock you into whatever exposure the highlights are at, which might make them a more difficult proposition to correct for afterwards and recover, such as the core of a bright galaxy, for instance. So if we shoot here at ISO 400, that just makes our life a little bit easier. We can get the same noise performance, same shadow recovery, but have a little bit better chance of recovering some highlights if they're already blown out. That's why we do that. If you want to learn more about that, link in the description. Also, if you follow that link, you'll find another link to most of these samples. Some of these samples we'll find out. By all means, download them, pixel peep, do all that good stuff. Just please respect my copyright, respect the fact that, you know, I went out there and had to sit through this for hours and just twiddling my thumbs at all hours of the night. I, I was out till like 4 a.m. So give me that at least. But please just use them to assess the camera or optic in this case. Most of these I think are taken with the Red Cat 51, which I will note here we have a, a focus frame. You can see we got some nice focus here. Some of you might notice that if you come to different parts of the frame, the focus is off. That's because the tilt in my optic wasn't properly adjusted for this camera and I just rolled with it and didn't think about it. And so there's a bit of a loss of focus towards some of the corners or edges based on how that thing was tilted. My bad, but it doesn't really affect anything because we're just looking at some samples here. So let's look at this one. This is a three minute exposure and it looks really good, really clean, although the stars look a little bit soft. I know it's a 26 megapixel sensor, but Keep in mind, we are looking through just the center of the Red Cat 51, and it does accommodate small pixel pitch, sort of high sensor density fairly well. But I think a little bit of this softness is actually due to the fact that this camera, unfortunately, does cook its RAWs a little bit. So a lot of that noise that you might otherwise be seeing is getting smoothed out algorithmically and baked into the RAW file, which I think is a bit of a downside. I want to be able to handle the noise the way I want to handle it. Not least of which because for astrophotography like we're doing here, it's actually important to have some noise because that noise can actually help capture faint details that you otherwise would lose. And that can help bring out nebulosity and that type of thing better. So that's not the best, but it is what it is, as they say. Uh, what do we got here? Three minute exposure. So this is tracked with the Light Track 2. ISO 400. This is what it looks like out of camera, by the way. <laughs> so this is what the sample is going to look like when you uh, download it, if you download it. And I will say that we did get some pretty decent detail here in the dust lanes. And as far as low light performance, you can see we're getting some of the further reaches of the Andromeda galaxy here, some of these dimmer points. So that's encouraging. On a good night, you could get a few of these and stack out a, a probably pretty decent Andromeda. And if we crank the exposure down, zoom in here, here we can see why shooting at ISO 400 is useful because we're able to capture a lot of highlight detail. Like we're plenty stops down now and all the way down to what is this? Let's go five stops. We're five stops underexposed and we can still see the core of Andromeda. That's pretty darn good, I'd say. So that is why I advocate for doing things the way I do as far as ISO 
comes into play. Come here, let's talk about Astro Tracer. This is a 60 second exposure, I believe. It's at 250 millimeters and ISO 1600, I think. This might have been one of my first successful attempts. I was trying to give a little more light to the sensor, a little more, I don't know, anything to get it to work. Because when I first started trying to use it, it wouldn't work. It would give me an error message and it was really frustrating and there wasn't a lot of information on what was going on. And what I was able to elucidate, I believe what was going on was it was not able to, to see stars good enough, possibly because of some of the sky glow. Now, I wasn't trying to like <laughs> image through like Shrek space here. So, you know, I wasn't being too unreasonable, but yeah, it just really wasn't working. I think this was one of the shots I was trying to do. You see there's a little bit of a cast, but very bright star here. So it just didn't work. And then it finally did. A couple of things to note. Red Cat 51 is a 250 millimeter focal length. And that means 375 corrected for the APS-C crop. Although here you see it's reporting 386, which is telling me that maybe the APS-C sensor in the K3 Mark III is just a teensy bit smaller than we might otherwise consider it being. It's maybe not a 1.5 crop factor. It is, according to this, more like a 1.54 crop factor. And that's something that a lot of you might not actually be aware of. Not every APS-C sensor, even in cameras from the same brand, are always the same dimensions. Sometimes they can be a little bit smaller, sometimes they can be a little bit bigger, and that goes for every sensor. Full frame, I'm assuming medium format, micro four thirds, sometimes one model, just based on how it all comes together, is a teensy bit smaller, and sometimes it's a teensy bit bigger, and that could account for this difference. But going back to Astro Tracer, one thing that I do want to mention, it was not very successful as far as numbers go. I had to throw away a lot of frames. I think I got about one in three usable frames. And when it worked, it worked. Like, here we are, zoomed in 400%, and, like, the stars are good. They're pretty tight. Nice and round. It's It did its job. And then the next frame, it just inexplicably wouldn't. And then the next frame after that, maybe it would work, and then it would poop the bed three frames in a row after that. It was really miss. Some hits, but a lot of miss. This was 60 seconds. This is standard Astro Tracer. What I did do at one point, you know, I had this set up on the tracker and I had just turned the tracker off to allow it to do its Astro Tracer thing. But then I thought, what if I turn the tracker back on and let the camera compensate for any errors? Because with the Astro Tracer Type 3, it's not doing the thing where it's using the GPS and, and the position and it knows what, you know, tilt it's at. It's not doing that. It's presumably just watching the stars trail and then calculating how it has to move to compensate for that. So I let the tracker go and then I put the camera on and tried it out and I was able to get up to a two minute shot this way where essentially the camera was compensating for the declination drift of the mount. Here you can see the stars are pretty round. It's a little bit of a tail on some of them which indicates there might have been a little vibration at some point but in others here it's not really noticeable so it's neither here nor there. But yeah two minutes not too bad. You could do something very usable with this. I am starting to see even a little bit of maybe extra detail around here. It's maybe getting some of that dimmer gas. So cool. It did tell me it could go longer than two minutes. I think it said nine minutes and something, but it wasn't able to actually deliver the goods on that. Basically, two minutes was the longest I was able to get. And this was with the tracker actually running. Some things I could see this being useful for, let's say you were taking a trip and you needed to pack a light. Well, I think this might be a good way to do that. You can take your camera and take your optic and a tripod and maybe leave the tracker at home. Might be worth it, depending on what you're doing. That success rate, though, is <laughs> just have to be prepared. And the other thing that's kind of annoying at this focal length is that you need to reframe pretty much every shot. Because while it does do a good job of tracking, the sensor has to go back to the original position afterwards. And all of a sudden, what was in the center of your frame is over in the corner or the edge or whatever. So that's not as much of a hands-off experience, let's say. But when it worked, it worked. It just didn't work often enough for me personally with the amount of hassle that I would prefer. But that's just me. Uh, this is a little fun one. This is taken with Pentax's 77mm 1.8 limited lens. Old sort of portraity lens for film cameras. And oh, we've come a long way. <laughs> the 90s were tough times. Also not big for astrophotography digitally. So there is that. But yeah, 
eat your vegetables and be thankful for the lenses that you have access to now, because they're way better than this. But uh, one killer app I would say the camera does have is the red mode. I don't know why more manufacturers don't do that. The amount of times I blind myself on the back of a Sony or a Canon, you know, trying to get into the menu to turn the brightness down is just ridiculous. This, that red mode made this a, a pleasure to use as far as the camera goes. Although I do wish it had an articulating screen in the back. Sometimes it was at a really awkward angle and, you know, you couldn't really review the image afterwards. Something to keep in mind. But, uh, yeah, that is probably where I'm going to leave it. Let's get out of here and wrap this one up. Well, is this the camera for you? I have to say, it is not the camera for me, but I was tempted by it. Uh, I do think that Astro Tracer is a really useful feature, especially now that it's less of a hassle. However, you know, it wasn't as uh, on point as I really would have liked. Like, there's a lot of wasted frames there. And I don't really understand why. Uh, there was that problem I had, uh, actually, where it just refused to trace. It just kept kind of crashing out on me and giving an error. And then just randomly started working. Uh, apparently that's due to the seeing conditions or the sky conditions. But, you know, if there's a bit of transparency loss or something like that, or the seeing's not great, my tracker still works when this didn't. So... I'm probably going to stay with the light track too, personally, uh, but I do see how this could be useful for a bunch of people. And, you know, if you do want to do the wider shots, you can get GPS thingy to go on it and use one of the other tracking modes there, the Astro Tracer modes. But overall, you know what? It's definitely compelling. If you're going to be putting a consumer camera on the back of a telescope or something like that, or uh, maybe a red cat or what have you. This might be a decent choice if you really are wide open for choice, but that's really not for me to say what's right for you. This is your choice. What works for you works for you. So if this does buy one, if it doesn't, well, hopefully you'll find something that does. Anyway, I've been a very tired Darren with Fervent Astronomy. Hope you have a great day and yeah, hopefully we'll see you in the next one. Take care.